Susan Smith has been arrested and will be charged with two counts of murder in connection with the deaths of her children, Michael three and Alexander, 14 months. Today we're gonna to talk about Susan Smith and she went to prison for murdering her two children by putting them in the, leaving them in the car and pushing them down a ramp into a, a lake and they drowned. So it's tough finding videos on these, but Greg, tell us what you found. Yeah, so most of these videos occurred during the nine days that she pretended someone had hijacked her car or carjacked her and taken her children, tied in two back seats, and she actually pushed them down a boat ramp and they died in the car and were found later after she confessed. This video, as Scott said, is not the best quality video, but it's all there is. And this is a case that's 20 years old. We've had many requests for this. Every time we bring up a murdering mother, this one comes up. I can't sleep, I can't eat, I can't do anything but think about them. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I just wanna hug them so bad <laughs> and tell them I love Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so right off the beginning of this, it might be true that she wants to hug them, she wants to do this, she wants to do that, but she's eye blocking. There is not a single bit of grief. There's no concern, nothing in the forehead. There's no snot, no tears. It's the worst kind of fake cry. It's a, Scott, I'm so sorry. You really don't like what I did. That's all it is. This is garbage. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you. So this eye closure is not from the crying. This is exactly what you just said, Greg. This is avoidance. There's no movement here in the chin boss, which we always see when we see shame and, and grief. Uh, there's a hygienic gesture during the crying. And it's not to wipe tears, which is very unusual. So adjusting your hair while crying uh, doesn't look very good. So she's kind of just pushing her hair back there. That's what we call in the behavior business, a hygienic gesture. And she said, I just want to hug them. And she has... Uh, had a, a tough childhood. And I think there's a baton gesture she does with her hand as she's talking her hands back here. I think it's her left hand. And what something that we always look for is things that don't line up. Scott talks about this in a lot of the other videos when a gesture doesn't really match up with a person's phrases. Uh, Desmond Morris called this a baton gesture. And what I think is interesting here is that the gesture doesn't match up with anything that's going on. It doesn't match up emotionally, uh, tonally, like with the tone of her voice or the cadence or the words that she's saying. So I, I would like to invent a new uh, a name for what we're seeing here where it doesn't match up with anything and just call it gesture arrhythmia. So, uh, okay. I, ca I called it uh, uh, il il illustrator non-alignment or something like that. The word alignment in there. For the illustration, so it's close. Illustrating. Yep. Very Called good. In the past. Yep. Yeah. I think this is uh, this gesture isn't associated with sadness or grief or loss or anything there. And that's all I got for this video. Mark, what do you see? Yep. So uh, I agree. There is what I would call incongruence. But, but I think you're talking about some extreme incongruence where it just doesn't really match up with ed anything. So uh, misalignment, arrhythmia, I think they're all good descriptions of that. Here's what jumps out at me. I, 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 them, then the grooming that you were talking about there, I, them, them, I. So there's way more eyes than them. They're, they're a, a, a collective. There's not even any names of the children. So it's very egocentric at this point. The male is very different from the female, different rhythm going on, not joining in with this, this crying, you know, even if it is you know, kind of fake. He's not even joining in, not joining in with anything real or fake here. And I think he gives a sour taste in his mouth as well. So I think there is some strong differences between the male and the female here. Female here, very self-centered in the description there. And the grooming, uh, as you say, Chase, is just, it's just not applicable in this situation at all. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. She's moving really slow. This lets us know that she's, there's a lot going on up here. She's thinking through what she's going to say. She, she doesn't really, she's not really experiencing these emotions. So we're not seeing them on her face. She's, she's showing us what she thinks we, that we want to see or should be seeing at this point. When you compare Susan with her husband, 
do this throughout all these videos when he's in there too. Dramatic. I remember I remember when this happened and I remember when she got busted or soon before she got busted because the, the we'll see a video. I'll, I'll I'll tell you that story when we get to that video because it's it's I I'll never forget I'll never forget that day. Um and everything is based on feel sorry for me. It's all about me and 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 just feel sorry for me. I you're right Marcus. I me. It's all about me at this point. And when you turn the sound off as you'll see in all these videos, if you'll do this, she looks like she's retiring from a, a job somewhere, or she. It, these are the same faces you see and the same emotions you don't see that you're not seeing when someone's retiring or someone is um, leaving a job and they're telling everybody goodbye. That's what it looks like. It doesn't look like somebody who's grieving over their children. It, it, it doesn't look like that at all. The stress we're seeing is is when she's moving slow and not looking up the camera and not connecting with anyone. So these are all we're all we're seeing a bunch of stress on her, rightfully so, because she's not telling the truth here, but she's sort of creating this. I, I think she had a pretty good idea of what she was gonna say, but that was it. I don't think she rehearsed this at all when she get when it before it came down to uh, game time for showtime for her. All right. Scott, I disagree with one thing you said fully. What? There's a lot going on in her head. I disagree. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I stand corrected. I can't sleep. I can't eat. I can't do anything but think about them. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I just want to hug them so bad and tell them I love them. <laughs> All right. I want to say it to my babies. <laughs> Your mama loves you so much. And your daddy, these whole families love you so much. And you guys have got to be strong because you are, we, 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 I just know, I just feel in my heart that you're okay. But you got to take care of each other. And your mom and daddy are going to be right here waiting on you when you get home. I'm going to go first on this one because it goes back to that video, our last uh, video when I was telling you about uh, something happened. When this happened, when this video came out, there are two versions of this video. We, I couldn't. I spent all night last night looking for the second version of it. And it's a wider shot with everybody, and it's got family mem members and other people in it. And she's talking. Her eyebrows are up. Look at everyone else. They show concern. Their eyebrows are down like this. They're they're thinking, oh my no, you oh know, my lord, what's happened? That's when my, this is before we even had cell phones, you know, or before I had one anyway, my phone started ringing and it was everybody I knew going, did you just see that on, did you just see that on the news? Did you just see uh, Susan Smith? I was like, yeah, we we're all like, holy smokes, man, she's going to the pokey because she did this. And when you, when you watch this again, when you, when you watch the replay, at least look at her husband. That's really the only one you can see in here. Look at his eyebrows. That's what her should be doing, showing concern. She shows no concern. And again, this is all about her. The content is all focused on her, on me, on I. Listen to what she's saying. No brow, no brow movement in there. No, no expressions really of anything. Nothing much moving at all. Um, and, and there's no plea to the kidnapper. You know, and she's telling these little children, one of them is three and the other one is a year and a half. And she's saying, look, take care of each other. Really? Have you ever said that to a, 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 a three-year-old and, and the other one? You two take care of each other. Are you kidding me? If they saw it, you know your mother's going to... Nah. She, nah, she stepped in it here. So um, and no anger, no nothing. We're seeing none of the emotions or expressions we should be seeing here. So that's a lot. And her eye, especially with her eyebrows, they shouldn't be up. They should be down. She should be focused and telling whoever's got her children that they're going to find them and, and they need to bring them back. That's what should be going on there. Okay, Chase, what do you got? Even even better. I fully agree with that. She met this alleged person who did this. She spent time with this person face to face. That's right. So that even makes it a worse case for the vanishing perpetrator. And what we're seeing here, there's showing of this more eye contact avoidant behavior, which is what she do, what she's doing. This is not avoiding to stop herself from crying at all. And I think it's interesting to note that she does this while she her eyes are staying at kind of five o'clock. So you can see where her eyes are looking uh, at a certain direction there, which suggests internal dialogue and not any emotion going on. And when does the chin boss move? It moves a couple of times here. It moves when she's talking about herself and how good she is as a mother. 
Uh, and while she's saying a lot of this stuff, we have lip licking. There's uh, right at the end here, lip licking. There's lip retraction. Lip licking is to make ourselves look better. Lip retraction is typically a need for reassurance right there at the end. And there's a complete lack of emotion. So I want you to go look and see what's missing here. If if a person, if she had met and witnessed a person take her children, what's really missing from this conversation? What's being hidden? And this is what's being hidden from this is the perpetrator. So when there's data being hidden, that's a huge red flag. Should be for anybody. Uh, Greg, what do you think? Yeah, I'll take it a step further. She didn't just meet him she described him even had an artist draw a picture and it was all bs it was all made up but here we see no grief no concern she stumbles through words because she's trying to think of what to say i interestingly scott you say her brows aren't down they're up but they're not even up they're just flat they're emotionless that's even worse if she was going like this or shock or something we might feel good about it the only time i see any concern in her brow at all is when she says I know you are okay, and her brows do something odd. You get a little flash of something right between her brows because she knows he isn't. Now, we often will talk about lipping, uh, lip licking and that, but Desmond Morris talked about something called a tongue jet, and he said it's baby's first way to reject something or something distasteful to push out. We're going to see her do the Morris tongue jet, not just this time, but other times too. When she talks about your mama and your daddy, and she goes like that, that's a, that's a Morris tongue jet all day. Then she bites her lip as she draws it back in. And I think that might be containment or an adapter. This is ugly. This is there's nothing good in anything she's doing. And to your point, Scott, the husband looks just like he's out of touch with everything. Now, he's also they're estranged before she does this. One thing you should know is they believe that the reason she disposed of her children is because somebody she had had an affair or at least a starting relationship with didn't want children. Sound familiar? Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, I'll tell you what's missing for me, uh, Chase, and, you know, whatever's missing for all of you and, you know, put it down there. But um, it's all I block as far as I can see. So there's zero from this angle for me, there's zero eye contact with that potential audience who might have information on where her kid is. You know, I would expect, and if it were me, you know, to be making a lot of eye contact with the public and trying to get information across is here's who we're looking for. And if you know anything, all of those standard things, I'm getting none of that. Um, yeah, the lip licking, the biting as well. It, they're very out of the ordinary for what we saw from her before. So they kind of come out of nowhere. That rings alarm bells. It's around when you get home. So there's something about that that push on when you get home and the lip bite there. That's alarming for me as well. Biggest alarming thing for me is when I usually see, uh, you know, a couple or a mother or a father or any kind of, you know, primary caregiver who is in this situation, the emotions collide. It's quite complex. There's a lot going on because they're trying to get information across as well. They've got the job of trying to contact the audience. They've got this job of trying to hold themselves together while doing that. Their mind is in a thousand places trying to understand what might be happening with this kid here you know regardless of what emotion she's doing or isn't doing it's super simple what's going on it's too simple as far as i'm concerned now often what we get is with this collision of emotions it's quite complex and and often observers will look at it and go oh there's something up there there's something up because it's not easily understandable i usually expect it to not be easily understandable because this is a situation that no human being on the planet has rehearsed for. They haven't had that moment of, well, you know what, when my kids go missing, here's how I'll handle my feelings. Here's how I'll understand this situation. Well, she's handling herself in a very simplistic way here. That rings alarm bells for me. Uh, that's all I got on that one. Have we all, we all been? Yeah. Yep. Good. I want to say it to my babies. <laughs> that your mama loves you so much and your daddy these whole families love you so much and you guys have got to be strong because you are we, 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 I just know I just feel in my heart that you're okay but you got to take care of each other 
And your mom and dad are gonna be right here waiting on you when you get home. I'll be getting a haircut this week and this hat will go off, come off. He said, no, we didn't have time because they were in car seats and it was going to take time for me to get them out of the car seat. And um, they just told me, he said, but I won't hurt them. And he just took off. But he had a gun and then my, my big thing is they were screaming, hollering, and crying. And I'm just scared that he just lost his patience or something. All right, Greg, what do you got? So let me tell you that when people go through trauma, especially something like losing a child, they're going to have really mixed emotions. And Mark, you're really good at pointing out that not everybody reacts the same. I think what you see, though, is a lot of difficulty containing emotions. There will be things bleeding all over a person's face from under this kind of duress. There should be some negativity in their forehead and that kind of thing, but we can't tell you exactly what's going to happen. What we don't see usually in a person who has experienced what she has experienced is this normal kind of conversational tone, because there will at least be some stress to the voice and those kinds of things. There's no storyboard on her face at all. Though Again, there's no grief, no concern, no anxiety, no stress. She's telling a story. This is rehearsed and prepared and as much as she could. And you can see she'll look over and try to recall a couple of words. We're going to see her do that again. And then she throws out details. Again, I always say the truth doesn't need support, but lies love a crutch. This is a crutch. Well, he had a gun. And he, well, the, the kids were in the back seat and they were strapped in. So he, he didn't want to take the time. And there's that and um. Desmond Moore's tongue jot again. Here we go. Blink rate goes up. She's getting a little amusement in her face or something like she thinks she's getting away with it. And the only time she shows any emotional accessing is when she says screaming, hollering, and crying. And she looks down and to the right. My guess is that's real. That's exactly what she heard is them screaming and yelling as they're banging on the windows trying to get out of the car as she pushed them in. And then she uses the most illogical thing I've ever heard. He had a gun, so I had to let him take him. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, listen to, I agree with you 100%. Listen to what she said. She's talking about this conversation she had with this guy. He said, you know, he had a gun. He said he was, you know, he wouldn't hurt him. You, there's no conversation during things like that. If this happened this quickly and this guy's adrenaline, if this supposed guy, his adrenaline is going to be just through the roof, so is hers. And she's going to be trying to protect the children. She's not going to be trying to have this conversation about stopping him from taking the children. She's going to be saying, don't know, those kind of things. And she crawls back there and tries to protect the children. That's why a lot of times these things get real ugly really fast with the person that gets, you always hear a, a woman injured or a man injured, whatever child was in the car, because they don't want him to take the child. I mean, they have the car or whatever, but there's no conversation going on there. There's no room for that. There's no time for that. It's completely made up. And we're seeing confidence here, I believe, because she knows she's, she, there's, there's nothing that she can get in trouble for at this point. She's rehearsed this answer. You're right, Greg. And so, so we're seeing confidence. She's just saying, this, here's the logically why this happened. So it makes total sense to me. I won't say she's not the smartest person in the world. I always say that. But that's why she's so calm, is due to confidence. And you're right, Greg, no concern, nothing. We're, seeing, we're not seeing the emotions we should see. She's talking at a pretty good clip, too. So everything here, I think she's confident with her answer at, the, at, at this point. I think she doesn't think anything's going to happen to her. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, great. Uh, look, this isn't the vanishing perpetrator here because she, she knows for some reason the psychology of this perpetrator. So given that we know this event didn't happen, where's she getting the psychology from? Well, I would suggest it's her psychology. This is a Rorschach test. Essentially, this is an ink blot. She's got to create reasoning for why these things happen and she creates them for her own from her own reasoning didn't have time going to take time he lost his patience or something so here's what i'm gonna speculate don't know anything about this particular crime first time i've ever come across it there was some situation that was pushing her time and therefore that's why she did this act because she felt crushed by time and something had to happen quickly around this we hear time stated again and again and again about a situation that didn't happen she has to be getting that from what's at the forefront of her mind at the time which is time and patience and running out of time in some 
in some way. It's a, what we're seeing here in this story is a projection of her own psychology. By the way, that's just speculation. I don't know that for sure, but I'd be willing to give a good gamble on it. Chase, what do you got on this one? You know how I think uh, we can tell this is rehearsed is she stays past tense the entire time. And lots of people, even smart people, have a very tough time doing that. So I think this is rehearsed that way. There's a huge blink rate spike. Uh, Greg, you mentioned it. Uh, in the original video, just before this, she was at about 22. And then it spikes to about 79, right when she kind of launches into this memorized story. And there's a little bit of lip licking just before this deception story starts and starts talking about this guy. But think about how we use the word just. The doctor says it's just going to be it's going to be a little hair pull or just a little pinch. Or if I say, what'd you do? What'd you do on Tuesday? And you said, I just went to work. The word just means that's it. And it's not that big of a deal. And that's it. And that's how we use the word just. So let me just give you a few instances of that here in this, just this one clip. It's just let me take them. He just told me, just took off. Uh, just let him, I, I can't remember what he said, but there's two, there's three more uses of the word just in here. I was just scared is what she said. And the whole entire thing, she's just using that over and over and over to say that's all there is to make us just jump over. I've used it twice now over that story as fast as we possibly can. So that's all I got on that one. Let me take them. And he said, no, he didn't have time because they were in car seats and it was going to take time for me to get them out of the car seat. And um, they just told me, he said, but I won't hurt them. And he just took off. But he had a gun and then. My my big thing is they were screaming, hollering, and crying, and I'm just scared that he just lost his patience or something. <laughs> you there at the time, and do you know what they were looking for? Uh, no, ma'am, I was not there, and uh, I do not know. I I did agree uh, sign a form for them to do that. I was aware they were going to do that, and I understand that's just uh, one of the. Uh, normalities they have to do in any investigation. All right, Chase, what do you got? Well, we see a little uh, internal dialogue just to come up with the word normality or maybe to recall that word normality, which I'm sure she's heard from a lawyer or something. I think it's a good example of her usage of this uh, eye movement for her. So if you see her eye movement in this video, uh, a lot of the eye movement you'll see is most likely truthful because she may not understand some of this stuff or she understands that this is a normality as part of this. And that's all I got. Scott. <laughs> okay. I think she's, I, I, I don't have much on this one at all. She's just calm. This is, she, she's thought about what she's going to say and she's, she's ready for the threat. That's why her head's back like that. And, and she looks a little bit cocky because she's prepared for the threat there. Cause so she's got her answer prepared. That's all I got on that one. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, you're right. It's it's back rather than forward, isn't it? It's very non-urgent. <laughs> What's going? You know, if it were me, if it were you, like you'd be really urgent about this. Like my my center of gravity would be right forward because I'd be wanting to get into action and contact uh, that that audience. Now, in this particular situation, it may be that there is no monitor in front of her, um, and so and so there might be some oddness there that she's getting a sound feed in somewhere. There's no Nobody else to look at possibly I don't know but regardless of that that the head is as you say Scott the head's back almost in arrogance there uh, and so there could be that element of arrogance and it's certainly set too back to be to be non-urgent um, lots of non-contractions in there so you know the fullness of the word that's kind of odd she's very civil during this so she's very agreeable uh and and she says I, I did agree to that uh normality so i would say she's trying to socialize the normal acceptable situation here she's trying to convince us here you know what 
nothing to look at, very normal situation going on here. Were it me or you, we'd be like, there is nothing normal about this. We have, I have not rehearsed for this moment in my life. I don't know what I'm doing here. I, I just got to get information out to the public out there about, let, let's, let's help me, help me, help me. There's none of that. Very odd. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I think she just ain't too swift. I think what she's doing is she's sitting there, and while we're giving her credit for holding her head up in arrogance, she's back against the back of the chair braced. She's ready for what's coming. I think she she is afraid of this woman, and you'll see it more in some of the others when she's on that couch. She's braced. She's rigid and wooden, and her head's up kind of in fear rather than in, you know, we always think of covering our throats. But then again, some people don't. And if they think they're trying to look natural, they look more wooden as they lock themselves down. She's overly polite, which makes me think the same thing. When somebody's overly polite and they're on their best behavior and they're trying to use their most polished language like normalities, or some others will hear her used, we're getting her trying to appear to be helpful. She's on her best behavior. Her blink rate is through the roof. And she's all that complicated language is her chance to try to look like she's being helpful. And then the last thing for me is her brow, and her brow doesn't move much, but it raises it when she says, I do not know, just quickly like that. I think she's scared, and this is her chance to try to put on her best act, put on her best airs, and try to get out of trouble. She did this on three network news shows, and this one I think is, is this was Katie Couric, is this the one? Yeah, so mm -hmm. she did it all three. That's it, that's what I got. Were you there at the time, and do you know what they were looking for? Uh, no, ma'am, I was not there, and uh, I do not know. I, I did agree, uh, sign a form for them to do that. I was aware they were going to do that, and I understand that's just uh, one of the uh, normalities they have to do in any investigation. Those sounds coming through here, y'all? No. No, can't hear it. What sounds? All right. Mila's wearing the cone of shame. Uh, right now, uh, <laughs> that's too bad. So she's running into everything. That's fine. Let's get let's get that lean in. You ready? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Let's go to the next video. Sources close to the investigation, Susan, uh, have told NBC News that federal agents are focusing, in fact, on the relationship between you and. Mitchell Sinclair, the, the man that you were going to visit that night, the man you said you were going to visit with your children, uh, they've told NBC that there were inconsistencies in your stories. Do you know what inconsistencies uh, they were referring to? Uh, no, ma'am, I really do not know that. Um... All right, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, we see her stop herself from smiling here, which is pretty unusual, and I'm just going to leave that uh, to you guys to walk, to walk through and kind of dissect. There is some pucker, some lip compression. There's licking. Uh, there's lip retraction going on here, which suggests all kinds of crap. Uh, you guys can dissect that too. But one thing I really want to pick on is watch her blink rate from before she hears the word relationship when she actually learns what the question is about. And watch the change in blink rate before the word relationship and then after the word relationship. And you will see a perfect example of what we always talk about. And there's also some hesitancy here. There's this qualifier where she uses the word really in the middle of her denial. There's a non-contraction. But please keep in mind, uh, we just saw an example of her most likely being truthful with a non-contraction. <clears throat> And there's also some double access to internal dialogue to craft an answer. And that would mean that there's accessing to internal dialogue, remaking eye contact, and then going back down again in quick succession, uh, which is also a pretty large red flag. And we know this is deceptive already, so I'll give my answer at 100%. How about that? <laughs> Scott, what do you think? All right. I thought when she said... Um, do you know what inconsistencies, what what inconsistencies were made or whatever? I thought she was going to say, "Do you know what inconsistencies means?" Yeah, hey, God, and I laughed so hard after that because I thought she was talking down to her. Anyway, at the top we see her lips. You're right, Chase. We see lip person. We see retraction. We see all kinds of things in there because what she's talking about 
she's she's she, it, it's catching her a little bit off guard because she brings up the guy she's seeing. She want to hear about that, but at the same right before that, she says something that makes her that is like yeah, it makes her feel like you know that's okay because she smiles at that point. It's not duping delight because at that point she's not saying anything or she's duping anybody. But we're, we're, there's a whole lot going on there. So, and especially when she gets back to the to the the part about the guy she's going to see, watch there because we see full on a lip pursing there, and that and that indicates that the per, that that person is um, doesn't agree with what's being said, and she sees it as a threat. Also, when you see her eyes darting around, that indicates the person is going through and um, processing the threat processing whatever's being said and getting and getting ready to, to as they structure their answer for that threat that's what we're looking at there um that's that's all i got on that one greg what do you got yeah that i that eye movement can mean that she is processing information it can also mean that she is looking for an answer to something that she doesn't have i mean it's, she's prepared for all this stuff and she's probably got something she wants to say there's also a high likelihood in her case that she can't hold a thought long enough to answer that question. Because if you watch how she behaves, she rambles and does whatever and then throws out something. Here's what's interesting. She's a low horsepower romancer because most romancers, when they look at you, they make really good eye contact. She'll say something and make really quick eye contact and then break away again. Probably something that's a learned behavior. She was in an abusive childhood and that kind of thing. So there's probably some of that not making really solid eye contact. Um, but that actual smile that she tries to hide is when she's thinking about this relationship or something comes up and then she breaks eye contact and does that tongue jut again. Is she going into memory? Is there something going on? Because then her blink rate goes through the roof, her breathing goes up, and she does that nervous confirming nod about the guy. So it makes me think she's got some kind of positive thing going on in her head about the guy, but then realizes, uh oh, 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 that was the wrong thing to do. Makes quick eye contact and does the, the nod. She does the mouth grooming, and when she says, no ma'am, her brows flash. We only see this eyebrow flash when she is doing something that's negative so far, as far as I can tell. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I agree. There is a complexity of emotions happening here, which she hasn't rehearsed for delivering or controlling in any way. So I think this idea of the boyfriend uh, that comes up and and it there's a, a real emotion that comes with that and she doesn't know what to do with that and she suppresses that delight. And it would be so easy to go to see that as Jupiter's delight. But Scott, you're absolutely right. This is not Jupiter's delight because it's the suppression of a real feeling of her imagining her boyfriend. And she hasn't, she hadn't prepared for this question in any way. So there's this huge kind of collision in many ways. Uh, you know, this is her being very real with us because she's not good when not rehearsed of being simple enough and controlling her feelings. So we get that suppression of delight and then she lets it out. She hasn't fully managed to suppress it. We get the lip lick. There's a lot of swallowing goes on there. Um, Non-contractions, polite as well. So some elements that we've seen before. Uh, yeah, I think that's all I have to say about that one. Sources close to the investigation, Susan, uh, have told NBC News that federal agents are focusing, in fact, on the relationship between you and Mitchell Sinclair, the, the man that you were going to visit that night, the man you said you were going to visit with your children. Uh, they've told NBC that there were inconsistencies in your stories. Do you know what inconsistencies uh, they were referring to? Uh, no, ma'am, I really do not know that. Um... Okay. <laughs> That's good. I may have hope. I mean, I, I've, after this long of time, I, I just, I just, I just don't feel like I just. It's just been so long, and I think if they were okay, then they would have been found by now. But it, it, the hardest part is just not knowing. Yeah. I mean, you know, and I, my heart just aches, and I miss them so much. I just can't express it, and. And it's, it's just a tragedy. And, and I just pray and pray and pray that they'll come home safe. All right. Chase, what do you got? I hate to keep going. No, I keep going on you first, Chase. But as it ends up, if I do the last person, uh, you know, whoever went last, if I do them first, then 
I'm trying not to it do that. Matter? Wait, we're, we're pretend I'm coming yeah. back. Yeah. All right, Greg, what do you got? <laughs> so she's shaking her head no. This is late in the nine-day ride. She's covered a whole lot of stuff during this time, and she's gotten away with a whole lot. This is the first time we see this, and it isn't fitting for what she's talking about. So I think she's like, uh oh, this is coming to an end because they've been questioning her over and over and over and over. So something negative is rising. Her brows are up again at it's a tragedy. Still no grief, still no uncertainty, still no questioning. She makes eye contact at please come home. Again, I think that's when she's trying to sell something. And she does a throwaway word or a fading fact, as you would call it, Scott, at safe. It just drifts off. She knows that's not going to happen. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so apart from that one moment where she clocks the audience with her eye contact, on the whole, she's in shade most of the time, if not eye blocking most of the time. So again, th th there's a, a moment here, you know, if, if truly you had hope, this would be another opportunity to be going, you got any information, here's, you know, get it to us, we're, we're in hope and, and, and clocking the audience directly. She's in shade all of the time. She says, I, every, about every two and a half seconds. <laughs> so that's a lot of, you know, it's quite a longish clip. That's a lot of the word I. She does mention them, again, as a collective, but doesn't mention the kids by name in any way. The main focus of this is herself. That's not what I would expect from somebody who is honestly concerned about their children at this point. She's concerned about herself. Um, yeah, and then the use of the word tragedy. Uh, it's like it takes a long, long time for a human being to view the drama that they've been through as a as a tragedy a long long time this is too early for her to be able to pull out of this event and go look given given all of these elements that were in there i view this as a real tragedy so wrong vocabulary to use at this point scott what do you got on this one all right again what she's saying it's her it's all about her it's i over and over and over again and we're seeing trance behavior here because she's i think she, they've got her against the ropes at this point in in this part of the end of their interview we don't see the whole interview just this one part that's why she goes into oh i'm just and she starts saying the same things over and over and she's sort of rocking back and forth a little bit and goes inward so you can't get to her and ask her more questions so we call that a trance behavior um her face seems like it's almost at rest in this thing it's if you if you turn the sound off you you may not even know anything's wrong here anything she would be worried about anything because again we're not seeing anything we should be seeing in here um her the whole answer again is focused on her it's all about her and that should be if you're if you're watching these things on tv and somebody comes up and you're looking at the parents and they're saying oh we don't have our our, our child this that and the other thing listen to how many times each one of them talks about themselves and how it's affecting them. And listen, to if they focus on that, because nine out of ten, I'm going to say eight out, of, eight out of ten times, that person would have guilty knowledge when they're talking about themselves. And it's about me and it's about I and about those things. So when you hear something like that, when you see someone on TV and they're interviewing them and their child has just gone missing, if they're talking about how much they feel about what's going on, pay attention to that. Chase, what do you got? I love that. Uh, and I completely agree. It's such a great uh, and interesting find that I think a lot of people would just kind of brush over because we, we tend to think sociologically, if somebody's in pain, that's what they're going to talk about on TV. So it makes sense to most people that if someone's just talking about themselves, they're talking about what they're going through. But it also is a huge red flag. In this video, we see no motion at all. And she's injecting ambiguity instead of doubt or uncertainty. And th let me just talk about the difference really quick. Ambiguity means I'm launching uncertainty into this in a way that one thing could mean this or not mean something, or I'm jumping over pieces. Doubt is comfortable with truthful tr people. They're fine with saying, I I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm really uncertain about this. So think about that different. Innocent people are comfortable with doubt and uncertainty. So in this video, you guys talked about some of these words. 
But think about how the words that she uses after the word I are injecting some ambiguity in here. And here we have, I mean, I mean, and I'm doing this in order. I just, I just, I just, I just, it's just, I think, I mean, you know, I just, it's just, I just. That's in this like super short video. And that's tons of ambiguity being dumped into it. So we're, if someone's injecting ambiguity, that's a big deal. And there's just weird, unusual smile at the very last tiny piece of this clip, which I think you'll be able to see pretty clearly. And Greg, if you would, would you educate all of us on what you think about her eyes uh, being kind of in this emotional accessing area throughout the video? And just, I, I was curious what you would, I have it in my notes here that to ask you about it. Well, I honestly think at this point, she's in a bind. She knows she's in a bind. So yeah, is she emotional? Yeah, this is up. That's why I say she's going, uh, I think it's all about her. That's the reason she's using the word I, the reason she's negative in the entire thing. And then she does that throw away at the end, come back safe. She knows they're not coming back safe. That's just trying to deliver some piece of information along the way. I think her brain is a squirrel in the road right now. And she doesn't know the right thing to say. The reason you're hearing filler words like just, just, mean, those are things because she's so engaged in how she feels and how dangerous this situation is for her is what I think, Chase. I think I'm it's glad over for her and she knows. Yep. I'm glad you said Thanks that because I think one of the things that we're seeing here is her, uh, one of the statistics we see in behavioral psychology is that people who suffer as children, which she did, and she was abused and had a rough, really rough time growing up. They, they have something called a dissociative capacity. And some things, if stress and hard lifestyle continues, then that person becomes a champion dissociator to where dissociation becomes or where we're kind of separating from ourselves or going someplace else mentally becomes the default stress handling mechanism. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing here is a dissociative response, which is part of a disorder, it's part of the diagnostic criteria for a histrionic personality disorder or histrionic disorders. Uh, but there's, I think, some other stuff going on here, too, that we'll eventually get to. That's all I got. I may have hope. I mean, I, I've, after this long of time, I, I, just, I just, I just don't feel like, I just, it's just been so long, and I think if they were okay, then they would have been found by now, but it, the hardest part is just not knowing. Yeah. I mean, you know, and I, my heart just aches and I miss them so much. I just can't express it. And, and it's, it's just a tragedy. And, and I just pray and pray and pray that they'll come home safe. Uh, you oh, guys missed I, did, I forgot. I stretched there. I didn't. <laughs> Right now, we want to go to Union to get the story firsthand from Susan Smith and her husband, David. Susan, how are you doing this morning? Uh, doing okay. Uh, very little sleep last night, but I'm okay. There was uh, some news yesterday and, and some promising leads uh, in this case. Uh, how, are, how are you coping with the disappointment of the news from yesterday? Um, it was... Um I was running around uh, my house yesterday morning all excited. I really thought that they had, uh, had, had really found something that was, uh, I really thought they had found one of my children. And um, when I got to the courthouse and found out that the lead had uh, disintegrated or when there was nothing there, I was very devastated, very disappointed. Uh, got my hopes up and was let down, but uh, I haven't given up hope. I, you know, that was, uh, maybe one of many disappointments, but maybe that's going to uh, be be right. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so she's very focused on her feelings, and I'll go through those in a moment. But I want to give a well, not some credit, but but put it in the context of there's two pretty bad questions that come forward in this. The first one is, how are you doing? So the interviewer has asked for her uh, emotion. So we could kind of go, well, of course, she's going to give her feelings because that's what she was asked. And I'll come to that in a moment. And then he goes, well, 
How are you coping with the disappointment? So he even delivers her a feeling to attach to. I would say terrible interviewing there unless you want to lead somebody into stating those emotions. Now, of course, she does. She says very little sleep, excited, devastated, disappointment, disappointed. So she lays in what she's been asked for, hopes up, let down, many disappointments and she kind of ends on on that so she's been a little bit led on that now having said all of that what i do notice in uh interviews with people who are not the culprit the perpetrator the criminal in this sense is you can lead them into emotions and they instantly go to uh, you know, they, they don't necessarily say this is not about me, but they take it off them and they naturally get on to uh, find my kids. They will get onto the kids immediately. She doesn't find her way there. She is led into her feelings and being self-centered. So there is that going for her, but she should be able to find her way out of that. And she doesn't. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, let's talk about leading her into something. When you see her left eye accessing this time, that's not her making up something, that's her repeating a word she has heard. Disintegrate is not a word she uses. That's a word that, that one of the investigators said, oh, oh, that lead disintegrated. That's the way they got her in to talk to her, just about guaranteed. Look at her, this is where I'm talking about, she's braced. She's in a fighting position. By that I mean, when you're in the army, you dig a hole, you get in there, you get your rifle, and you defend yourself. She's braced, she's locked back in the chair, she's barriered. She's got what I call egg protector. In men, we call it the fig leaf. We, cr we cross our primary sex organs. She's crossed her arm in front of her abdomen and she's locked down with her husband there and she's twitching fingers and doing all kinds of adapters. Her blink rate is through the roof and she's braced for whatever you're going to ask her. She's ready for this whole thing. She gets pressure and she does something we've only seen one other time on the entire behavior panel sh show and that's she does this pressured release of words at the end she's feeling pressure she rambles and when she's done she didn't edit so she's got words left over that mean nothing might be right something is wrong right there be right with those leftover words something's wrong she had a plan which she was going to say and it didn't come out correctly she tries to redirect and if you look and you really want to think about what would a person like this look like they wouldn't be pushed back against the chair if they've been through all this trauma. They would look like him. He's shocky. You can see his brain can't comprehend what's going on. Never mind, the TV camera might be part of it. But she has none of that. It's all just her. It's all just her telling whatever story she came there for. And the only place we see it's that pressure in the end and her using the wrong words. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, so I think uh, she starts this video off in stress. So when, when this video starts again, here's what you're going to see. So if you're watching this on your couch, living room, wherever, you're going to see two things big time. Her respirations at around 20 to 23. Her blink rate is at around 60. And keep in mind, the average blink rate is like 13, 15, somewhere in there. Everybody's a little different. Her, She uses a three o'clock eye movement to answer this question. So her eyes go to your three o'clock as you're watching it, which is her baseline. So that's her baseline. She's probably genuinely recalling how she feels for just a moment here. But I think her thumb is a great reliable indicator and she's using her thumb as a pacifier a little bit with her husband. But with the, the biggest red flag in this entire interview in its entirety is her saying, I think they, they might have found one of my children, one of her just saying that is a huge indicator that this is something is way off in this. And then there's a uh, super increase in blink rate right when she says one of my children. I think she either realized she made a mistake or that topic alone caused her some stress. Uh, you can decide that. But there's some internal dialogue where her eyes are going down this direction to describe her uh, disappointment. But I think what's interesting to see the whole picture here is that this is a woman hoping her children are never found, trying to show excitement for children being found and then disappointment that they were not found at the same time. 
So there's a whole lot going on and we're seeing a lot of mixed emotions. I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing a lot of this strange, unusual behavior going on here, because I think the husband here uh, might still be a little hopeful and might still be a little scared or might be starting to suspect the person sitting beside him, which is another reason for him to be frozen still in this video. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Uh, I went. Uh, good. Be, that was a uh, test. You let's passed. Be, let's be Scott, uh, I think. Scott, what do you let's got? be me. All right. Uh, let's take a look at her thumbs. We're in this, her thumb. She's, she's over there and that. She's adapting like a you-know-what on that guy, man, just pulling her hand and pulling his hand and, and squeezing it and doing her thumb up and down. That's an adapter. She's trying to get rid of that built-up stress or tension she's feeling at that time, and she's under a lot of stress. We know that because she's really still. She looks like somebody just walked in and said, what are you doing? She's like, what? Nothing. What are you doing? And she's in the middle of doing something she shouldn't be doing. You're right. Her blink rate is high. It goes through there and starts to tick, 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 tick. I just did a Greg. But her, her blink rate goes way up. So she's under attack and she's feeling that threat. That's another reason she's really, really still. Um, that's, that odd smile at the top, that's, she, she doesn't know that's not the thing to do. Uh, that's why we're seeing that. And this in this video, we're seeing her, her nostrils are flared uh, more than any other video up to this point. I mean, they're almost the whole time they're wide open, taking in that oxygen, her fight or flight's on because she's under attack. And she, and she knows that. So all these things we're talking about here, we're seeing all the distress. She's extremely stressed at this point. And when she starts talking about uh, hoping the children are okay and they find at least one and all that, that she, I think that's dawning on her as it's coming out that that's, that's odd to be, to be talking like that. And I agree with you, Chase. You're seeing a lot of things going on uh, about what she's thinking right there. She's thinking about one thing as she's talking about something else, but trying to make it look like something else. That's, uh, that's a great find. But all that leads to stress. So we're, we're just seeing somebody. If you want to see somebody under a lot of stress, take a look at her at this point. All right. Just keep watching. Yeah. Right now, we want to go to Union to get the story firsthand from Susan Smith and her husband, David. Susan, how are you doing this morning? Uh, doing okay. Uh, very little sleep last night, but I'm okay. There was uh, some news yesterday and, and some promising leads uh, in this case. Uh, how are how are you coping with the disappointment of the news from yesterday? Um, it was um, I was running around uh, my house yesterday morning, all excited. I really thought that they had uh, had had really found something that was. Uh, I really thought they had found one of my children. And um, when I got to the courthouse and found out that the lead had uh, disintegrated or when there was nothing there, I was very devastated, very disappointed. Uh, Got my hopes up and was let down, but uh, I haven't given up hope. I, you know, that was uh, maybe one of many disappointments, but maybe the next gonna uh, be be right. Oh, there it is, finally. Even folks in in Union wonder about the both of you. They wonder if uh, all of the truth of this story has been told. Susan, what do you say to that? Um. I say that the the uh, on behalf on my behalf the truth has been told. Um, I know right here what the truth is. Um, I can I can from some I can see from their side uh, why they have to do the things they have to do. Uh, but the Lord and and myself both know the truth. I did not have anything to do with the abduction of my children. Um, I don't think any parent could love their children any more than I do, and I would, I'd never even think about ever doing anything that would harm them. And Dave. yes, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead, Susan. I was just gonna say it's very painful to, to have a finger pointed at you when it's your children involved. All right, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, so we see- We're, on, still, uh, we're, we're still, still sharing still on the screen. Oh, sorry, oh, shoot. sorry, fellas. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I'm going to say one thing about this. The moment you bring in a supernatural entity as a character witness, probably something is up. I, I'm, I'm not bothered about, you know, if you believe in gods or don't, or it's not really that. It's the fact that you're bringing in something which is 
high authority, you know, any any kind of supernatural, you know, entity, God is high in authority, but tends to be very low in presence. I, I understand the kind of omnipresent, you know, uh, uh, idea, but but they very rare. You can very rarely get a god or demigod to show up anywhere. So it's a great way of going. Look, highest authority uh, says you know, I didn't do this. And by the way, you'll never be able to call that entity to the stand. Imagine, imagine I'm in the same position and I go, look, um, Thor and Odin uh, absolutely know that I didn't do this. At what point would you go, oh, all right, well, Thor, if Thor and Odin think you didn't do it, then, you know, call it off. Everybody go and look somewhere else because Thor and Odin say Mark didn't do it. You would, you would be incredulous. Now I know, you know, Thor and Odin are, are, are gods from, you know, Norse sagas from way, way back. They may not feel very present right now, but it's the same idea. Calling on a supernatural entity as your character witness, kind of knowing that they have high authority, but they're never going to show up in court. Chase, what do you got on this one? I totally agree. And we've seen that in, in so many videos that uh, a lot of people will just use that as the, as the star witness. And if you watch this video a couple of times, you'll see a lack of affect. And she's had a, a past life history of affective instability. There's a non-contracted denial here. But I think one of the cool things that we occasionally talk about on the show is a humorous retraction. And that's not when you stop being funny. That's when this bone starts pulling into the body. One thing that fear makes us do is protect arteries. Fear makes a human body start protecting arteries. So this arm starts squeezing into the body at a very specific time here, which is a fear response. And I want you to take a look and see if you can see when that happens here. There's an increase in blink rate in this video from 18 per minute to 95. And there's distancing language where she says, my children, she's not saying their names. We hardly ever, if ever, see her uh, use these names. And this thumb sticking up, Here's where that thumb, or she's holding her husband's hand, her thumb is kind of poking up like that. This is where I was like, oh, she's got a thumb up. I'm going to see something. But I didn't. There wasn't a whole lot of movement with this thing. And I thought we're going to see some digital flexion, some movement. But what we're really seeing is a the arm comes in, which indicates to us there's fear. So we're seeing a bodily freeze. So she's freezing the body so that all of the cognitive capacity is available. She doesn't want to move anything. She wants to maximize cognitive capacity. And that's what we're seeing here. And there's prolonged eye closure uh, during her denial, right when she says the words did not. That's when we see the longest amount of eye closure. And you can see it for yourself when the video comes right back up here. Scott, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with you. And she's feeling the threat here because she's very still. And that's indicating that she's uncertain about what's going to happen next at this point. And I think the part about the thumb, a lot of times you'll see the thumb when someone is confident. If you don't, if their thumbs are hidden or down, uh, their, their confidence level is low. And I think it's stuck there where she's got it with, with his hand. So it's it's so tight, it's just sticking up the way he's grabbing her hand, probably holding holding her hand. Going back to what Greg said about him being freaked out because he's, he's feeling a lot of stress too. He's And he looks the way he should look at this point. She puts her hand to her chest, and this whole thing here is called the suprasternal notch. That little, that little uh, dimple right there in your check or in your in your uh, neck, and it's uh, a lot of times you'll see when women have something emotional happen or you get bad news about your child. <clears throat> the women will touch that suprasternal notch. She gets really close. She gets right up on it, but not right to it. And she does this twice. This is, these are the most illustrators we've seen so far with her, her hand movement. That's that's the biggest thing we've seen so far. But she hits that twice and because she thinks she's supposed to. She's saying, I know, but that, and, and one at one point, the finger does get really, really super close to that, but it crosses it like that. So she's not really feeling the emotion she should feel here. She's mimicking the emotion she's seen. She's not a psychopath, I don't think, but but she does have a couple of the, the, the you know, of uh, the items on the psychopath checklist from Robert Hare. You know, the lack of affect in 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 her face, and and like Chase was talking about earlier, but I don't think that's what we're dealing with here. Um, 
again, and you're right, Mark. That that that's a red flag when you bring up religion. And, he's, and don't get me wrong, you know, when it comes to God, he, you know, he loves you, but I'm his favorite. So that's where I'm sitting and all that. But when you bring up God in situations like this, there's no reason. There's no reason to do that. There's no reason whatsoever to do that. I always start focusing when when somebody brings up God. That's when I go, oh, this is good. Here we go. And then you can dig in even deeper because something's up there. They're they're in panic mode at that point. Little or no brow movement and. That, that husband, he's the adapter. She's over there just squeezing his hand, and he's squeezing hers back, and that's why we get that thumb up like that. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, he's more than an adapter. He's sacred space. He's got her locked down, and they're adapting. And I guarantee you, before this thing started, she put her hand in his and said, help me through this, something like that. So uh, he's gripping and holding her and protecting her. She eye breaks to block. I mean, she she'll break eye contact to block primarily to get away from something. But Chase, you hit something really important, and that's that her fight or flight is through the roof. And if you'd want to find good indicators, it's not just the blink rate or the oh, when she exhales because she's trying to talk through all of this fight or flight. It's also that her nostrils are really flared, and that happens when we're in fight or flight or when we're angry. Typically. She does a whole lot of um, ah, um, ah, um, ah, um, ah. And that's because I think she's working on low horsepower and she's trying to access everything she's got. It's the reason she's not moving her body a whole lot. She tries to go to emphatic, I think is what she's doing here. She's trying to be emphatic and convince someone that no, it's just this. And there's a reason we know that people say things like, as God is my witness and that. In the business, we all say they take holy ground. And that means it's used a whole lot when somebody's coming up with a name for it. My favorite part of this entire thing is that she actually doesn't know when she's been handed a gift. This tells you she's not very smart. When the guy interrupts her, she gets annoyed. Go ahead. She should have just gone, thank God. But she's not smart enough to figure that out. And she lets it go again. And then she has something else to say because she's got to get one up. My bet is that this talking like this and all that and this flat face, this flat affect is because she knows she's in real trouble and she's got to try to be as contained as she possibly can. It's not that she has no affect. Usually I would bet that she does a little bit of a little bit of heightened affect occasionally if you're dealing with her. So I think we're seeing just her lockdown as tight as she can make it. That's all I got. Even folks in, in union wonder about the both of you. They wonder if uh, all of the truth of this story has been told. Susan, what do you say to that? Um, I'll say that the, the, uh, on, behalf, on my behalf, the truth has been told. Um, I know right here what the truth is. Um, I, can, I can, from some, I can see from their side uh, why they have to do the things they have to do. Uh, but the Lord and, and myself both know the truth. I did not have anything to do with the abduction of my children. Um, I don't think any parent could love their children any more than I do, and I would I'd never even think about ever doing anything that would harm them. And I guess, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead, Susan. I was just gonna say it's very painful to, to have a finger pointed at you when it's your children involved. As a fun fact, the behavior science term for nostril flaring is wing dilation. Now that you're a panelist, you can go look that up. That's beautiful. <laughs> we should put that on the bingo card. I will. Susan, we're led to believe that uh, investigators spent quite a bit of time at, uh, at your place yesterday. Is that true? Uh, yes, sir. And what do you think they were looking for? I have no idea. I granted them permission to search my house under the impression that was one of the normalities of uh, the investigation. Uh, as far as what they were looking for, what they took, I have no knowledge of that. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, look, people can do all kinds of odd stuff under stress and, and pressure, and we have to accept that. <laughs> However, I don't really expect this kind of odd behavior. It's 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 too reasonable. Um, it's too locked down. This idea of normalities. It's too civil. It's too formal. She's not displaying, showing, letting out any of the. She's in control of the anxiety. I'm not saying she's not feeling anxiety because we know she is, but she's locking it 
down and that's not a behavior that i would expect now i'm not saying that you wouldn't have a parent who would be feeling anxiety trying to manage that at the same time as trying to contact the audience at the same time as trying to manage their partner at the same time as thinking where are my kids and who's taken them there should be so much complexity going on here that i wouldn't expect anybody to be able to lock down this hard. So too reasonable, too, too, uh, too normal. Trying to, she's trying to project, as she says, normality. So she's trying to be too normal, too civil, too formal. Uh, I don't buy it at all. And you know, and I know it just looks super weird right now. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I'm just going to touch on something that's missing. So she says, yeah, uh, she doesn't know why they're going to her house. So when we, I just bought a new dog, it's a Belgian Malinois, but when she was a puppy, we went to the breeder's house to go meet them. The mom came out and didn't know where all the puppies were for just a minute. And I walked over to where the puppies were usually kept. They weren't in there. And the mom followed me to look for the dogs because even a dog knew the reason I was going in there was to look for her kids. So any parent on planet Earth would know the reason they were looking there, the reason or what they were looking for is evidence or clues to find the children. Saying I have no clue is absolutely ridiculous. Was there a stalker? Is there evidence about where they were? Somebody might have taken them. Maybe something to help me find my kids. That should be clear as day for anybody. But this shows some pretty clear deception that if they're willing to say they don't know what the police were looking for, that there's guilt. Scott or Greg, what do you got? I think she's out of hard drive. I think she's just at a point that she's got nothing left. And you watch her respiration. I mean, she's damn near hyperventilation here. If you're paying attention to it, you can see her respirations going. And remember, I said she's in a fighting position. Here's how you can tell. She started off, you couldn't see her nostrils, and then her nostrils flared. And now you can see into her skull as her head is back. That's the only place she has to go. And you can see up her nostrils. Her nostrils are flared. That's her escape. She's looking down her, the bridge of her nose at this reporter, and she's trying to answer questions. She's on her best behavior again. Yes, sir. That nostril flare is fight or flight, and you can't miss it. And she's trying to, to do the best possible thing she can. She uses words that I would not associate with the rest of her vocabulary, things like normalities and things like no knowledge of that. That sounds a lot like, did you have knowledge of X, Y, or Z? This is a normality for what we do. Might be something a police officer might say to her. And I think she's regurgitating those words as kind of a chaff and redirect, and she's not good at it. So she's just in a position where she's locked down, she's in fight or flight, and that's all she's got. Scott, what do you got? All right, again, we see that thumb adapting and no illustrators, nothing. And to go back to, to Albert Bray, and I called him Breege last time. Sorry, Albert, but if you're watching this, I'd pronounce your name wrong last time. But it's Albert, Albert Bray. And in his studies in, in, uh, that he did, he talked about how the person who uses the least amount of adapters compared to someone who's telling the truth, that person is most likely lying. People who are, who are lying don't use uh, illustrators very often at all, not much at all. You're right, Greg, her head's cocked back because she's, she's, she's I, at the same time, I think it's a little bit of arrogance here because um, she's taking on a threat, but I think she's ready for it. And she's she knows she has to do it, but I think at the same time, you're right, she's she's afraid uh, of the threat. It's it's an odd uh, combination of stuff there. And again, we're seeing her nostrils, nostrils flared, not quite as wide as that one we saw earlier, but man, but it's because her head is back. It's because you can see right into her skull, almost into her frontal lobe there, if you look real close. <laughs> um, everything else is it, it, very small. Her voice is, you know, her, her voice is uh, quiet here. All that, all these things, again, lead to stress. All, if you pointed out, bullet pointed all these out and put an arrow toward it, you'd have the word stress there. That's what I've got on my notes. Okay. We good? Yeah. Susan, we're led to believe that uh, investigators spent quite a bit of time at, uh, at your place yesterday. Is that true? Uh, yes, sir. And what do you think they were looking for? I have no idea. I granted them permission to search my house under the impression that was one of the normalities of uh, the investigation. Uh, as far as what they were looking for, what they took, I have no knowledge of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> you kept me twice, Scott, so I had to get you back. <laughs> <laughs> David, the question that that arises and in, in people who have been following this so closely and, and certainly you have to know how much emotion that this is, has generated across the country is why someone who would uh, be interested in, in, in carjacking or, or stealing a car would want to continue to, to take a couple of little kids with them. Have, have you been able to fathom that or or could you think of why someone would want to kidnap a couple of little kids and, unless there was some ransom or something involved? No, I have no idea why the suspect has, why he even took the children and why he has not released them yet. We have no knowledge whatsoever. All right. <laughs> Wait a minute. Hang on a second. That was going to do it, man. All right. <laughs> Still going to do it. All right, Chase, what do you got? All right, Greg, what do you got? <laughs> or Mark, what do you got? <laughs> <laughs> She's going to pass out if she keeps this interview up. She's in a place where her respiration is fluttering now. You can't miss it. I mean, you watch her, her, her breathing rate. I didn't count, but I'm going to guess it's somewhere around 40. That's pretty fast. It might even be higher than that. Chase, you probably counted. She's licking. She's grooming her mouth. All this stress is now caught up with her. Her eyes are down, down to the right, and then back up. And then when he says, my favorite in the whole thing, and I'll leave it at that, when he says, well, we don't know, her mouth moves. Now, children, if you have a child and you don't teach them not to, when they color, they'll go, because when we're thinking and working out something, we move our mouths. Mammals do. It's just what we do. Horses do it. Dogs, all, all of us move our mouths a lot, but humans, when they're little children, will do it all the time. And I think that's leakage in her case of, well, maybe. I think she's trying to figure out what she's going to say to make that w come to the next level. If she were in a chair, I think we'd see pre-confession movement. She would start changing her body style here. Uh, Scott, what do you got? I got 10 bucks that says somebody's going to make a gif of you doing that with your mouth a second ago. <laughs> I think within a week we'll be on Instagram. Anybody want to take bets on that? I know where you that? live. I'll go to, I'll go to I 50 bucks. I know where you live. <laughs> I know. <laughs> anyway, so that's If somebody happen. shows up at your house with a chain and drags your traverse around, it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Amber would tell you, and so... Go out and get something else. <laughs> so uh, at this at this point, I think her fight or flight is it's the highest it's been so far. She's panicking as this guy's talking because she's thinking, is he going to say something that's going to get me in trouble? Is he going to say something something that that I'm not ready for that I can't defend at this point? Her blink rate is through the roof, and her nostril nostrils are flared again. We say that one more time. I think her fight or flight's through the roof. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I think you're right. I, I think we actually see her ramp up in this. I mean, she starts pretty high and she goes up higher. And I think it's because her, her partner here, I guess it's her husband, um, uh, really starts kneading into her, her muscle tissue there, uh, because he is not prepared for this at all. He's in high anxiety. That is a strong signal for her. She, I think, is now going, well, this guy's out of control. So just as you said there, Scott, what's he going to say? Is he reliable? And I think her breathing rate ramps up even further at, at that moment there. So always great to see the combinations that happen, not just focus on one individual, but how's the partnership working? Uh, just as I think it was Scott was saying earlier, you know, that in that video um, that I don't think we can see, but he was saying, look, you know, if you look around the subject, you get to understand the subject. Look at the partnership that's happening here to understand the subject. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I love that. So let's really quickly touch on nostril flaring or wing dilation, as we call it. We have an adrenaline spike that produces an, a, an equally high demand for oxygen. And when you're trying to conceal your need for oxygen, because most of us would just open our mouth and openly breathe bigger. But when we're trying to conceal it, we use the nostril flaring unconsciously. Our brain just says, okay, dilate the nostrils if you're trying to keep your mouth shut to oxygenate the blood going to the brain uh, primarily. I like that the perpetrator appears. The husband is asked, and now there's a perpetrator. We even hear the word suspect, which is great. And he's using his wife as a pacifier 
uh, throughout this thing. You can see him just kind of going crazy. And she, I think she's stroking his hand to help calm him down and just kind of get him ready. Just remember what we talked about. Just kind of just go right along what we talked about. But I think there's a strong drop of the thumb of her thumb onto his hand at the end of his statement. And right when he's saying uh, no knowledge whatsoever, but you're right. The, the blink rate and breathing spikes as he begins. So we actually, in this clip, we're not seeing it super high. We're seeing it spike from the beginning. So we're getting to see it escalate. So you'll be able to see that and kind of train your brain to see that in your everyday life uh, using this video as well. That's all I got. Hey, but the question that that arises and in, in people who have been following this so closely and, and certainly you have to know how much emotion that this is, has generated across the country is why someone who would uh, be interested in, in, in carjacking or, or stealing a car would want to continue to, to take a couple of little kids with them. Have, have you been able to fathom that or, or could you think of why someone would want to kidnap a couple of little kids and, unless there was some ransom or something involved? No, I have no idea why the suspect has why he even took the children and why he has not released them yet. We have no knowledge whatsoever. Uh, that was a good one. Susan, what do you think? Um, I think it takes a very sick and emotionally unstable person uh, to be able to, to take two beautiful children like that, to be able to keep them from their parents to keep them from where they do belong. Um, I, I, I don't, I can't imagine why anybody would want to do such, any, do such a thing as, as what has happened. Chase, what do you got? So we see uh, a lot of this stuff that's going on here. Let's do a linguistic analysis really quick. She's saying this uh, sick and emotionally unstable person. I think this is what's what we call a defense strategy revealing itself that if something does happen, she gets to clean her own butcher block or define how she's seen. Uh, but I want you to concentrate on her words, it's just to be able to. Then she says to be able to. Then she says to be able to. Then she says to be able to. Four times there. So and she describing the crime as such anything or such a thing as what has happened. But back to this word able, it's able indicates capacity or ability or potential. So it's not an action. So she's not speaking about anything that actually happened. She's speaking about something that's a hundred percent hypothetical here. There's more vanishing perpetrator. And remember she apparently met and stood face to face with this person, and he's still not mentioned. She mentioned some ethereal, unimaginable human, even though she has apparently seen this person face to face. She's unable to mention the crime. She's unable to mention the kids' names or the perpetrator. And this is a wonderful spot as an interrogator. This is the exact moment that I would start inserting the punishment question. What do you think should happen to the person that did this and get, cause she's already in the mood to clean her own butcher block and define herself. This is the perfect moment to do that. Scott, what do you got? All right. Well, you covered everything. So I'll just talk about stress for a minute. Let's talk about everything we've seen at this point. Everything leads to stress. Everything she's doing shows she's stressed and she's under attack and she feels the threat. So that's why we're seeing the nostril flare. She's been really still. Her, her senses are, are odd, oddly constructed. Everything just, it sounds off because she's under stress and she knows this is, at some point, things are going to get worse than they are right now because they're going to find those kids and it's going to get worse for her. Uh, uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so if you're a panelist, which I hope you are, which means you've subscribed and you've maybe been watching us for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, maybe even as much as a couple of years, you're now probably getting pretty good at analyzing behavior and body language. And what you're going to notice about other people out there is when they analyze body language and behavior, all they're really doing is telling you what's going on inside their own head. It's just a Rorschach test because they don't have the ability like you're going to be having right now of really critically thinking what's going on. 
I think that's what we've got here, another Rorschach test, because you've got somebody here diagnosing an imaginary perpetrator. She knows they're, the only perpetrator is her. So what story has she got other than a sick and emotionally unstable individual? This is a self-diagnosis, essentially. I mean, it's not a particularly, you know, anybody uh, who's a who's a psychiatrist uh, analyst will be able to do a more acute um, uh, analysis, but she's not far off. As an amateur, she's not far off uh, on herself. So that's what I'd say we've got there is that's a beautiful piece of uh, simple self analysis that she's giving us there a Rorschach test. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so I love this one because she has prepared. You said butcher block, which I find kind of interesting, Chase, because in the old days, we would have called these flip charts butcher block, just the paper. And I think she put a list of things, not maybe not literally, but a list of things she needed to cover to cast who could have done this to her children. Now, interestingly, she was able to describe what he looked like, what kind of hat he was wearing, even to an artist. But she was not able to say, this scumbag who took my children, when we're angry about losing our children, we don't go, we go and tell, and we're aggressive and pushy, and we're not seeing any of that. No brow down, it's all that head back, leaned, and her mouth wrenches a little bit before she starts, and then she accesses her left as she's bringing up these things that she was saying. She's like, finally, I get to say something I know how to say. And she is more clean, clearly spoken because she's prepared it. I think it's just more of the act and she's barely able to hold into it even through fight or flight though she finishes her sentence. That's what I got. Greg, let me ask you this. What do you keep in that pocket right there with a the zipper? I don't know. You'll never know either. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, what do you think? Um. I think it takes a very sick and emotionally unstable person uh, to be able to to take two beautiful children like that, to be able to keep them from their parents, to keep them from where they do belong. Um, I, I I don't see, I can't imagine why anybody would want to do such any do such a thing as as what has happened. Mark, what do you think about what we're seeing here? Yeah, so here's what I want you to do. Take a leaf out of uh, Scott's book there, which is look around what's happening when you're analyzing a situation, not necessarily at the subject themselves. Look around the subject and see how other people are reacting. That's what I take away from this, because we've got some great examples there of being able to look at other people's behavior around this particular subject. Chase, what do you think? Yeah, I think uh, there's some there's a good case to be made for uh, there's some evidence here for many different mental issues that are going on. I'm not a professional, so I'll leave it alone. And maybe next video we'll break out the big DSM. But for this one, just use what uh, I will give you a legal term, which is the reasonable person standard. And we just ask ourselves from a critical thinking perspective, like Mark always talks about, how would a reasonable person feel if their children were kidnapped? Would you be angry? We're not seeing any anger. Would you feel sad? We're not seeing that. Would you beg for your children back? Would you use their names? Would you say it on TV? And not just yourself, but think about other people that have different lifestyle than you. So let's just use the reasonable person standard. And that helps us to discover what's missing and what's being hidden from a conversation that we see anywhere we have one. Greg? Yeah, I think you just hit dead on the, uh, the nail dead on the head. Reasonable person, because what we see here is somebody who's covering up something. What we can tell about this person is they're not reacting normally. Normal is lots of different things because there's no such thing in humans. But what we do know is that we're not defending self when a child goes missing. If you lost your dog tomorrow, do you start looking for reasons why your dog is missing or do you start looking for the dog? These are children and we don't see a bit of concern. We don't see a bit of grief. We don't see a bit of anxiety. Usually when people are de dealing with this, we looked at the McCann's, they look bleached after days of their children being gone. There's no bleach to this. This person is talking like a normal person and she's talking about this person who is mentally ill that she let take her children because he had a gun. Come on, it just all of these pieces of a story just don't fit. Well, yeah, of course I let him take the kids because he had a gun. 
This is all of this going together is just as bad as Diane Downs. There's no logic to the story. There's no there's no flow to the story. And the reason that she's not upset is because she knows they're dead and she knows she's got to protect herself. That's it. Scott, what do you got? I think this is a great study in stress because we see we see sure. her under stress in all kinds of different situations or different interviewers. So I think this is great because we're seeing all the the earmarks of someone who's being dishonest or being deceptive as we go through these. Everything from the nostril flare to the um, being very still to the head back, heavy breathing, the the, the blink rate going up. I, I think it's wonderful and how she talks about herself the whole time. Again, if 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 you'll focus on what they're saying when you see people who are being questioned about missing children, missing husband, missing wife, whatever. Listen to how, listen to whether they talk about the, the person missing or they talk about themselves and how they feel about everything. That'll give you a, a heads up of what's happening because most of the time if they're talking about their self, themselves the whole time, that's a big red flag. So if you like this video, watch this one.